This is Talking Drupal, a weekly chat about web design development from a group of people with one thing in common. We love Drupal. This is episode 393, Drupal and JavaScript. Welcome to Talking Drupal. Today we're talking about Drupal and JavaScript with Andy Bloom. Andy's a senior front-end developer at Lullabot, former high school science teacher, developing professionally since 2016. He lives in Ohio, and he's the Olivero subsystem maintainer. Andy, welcome to the show, and thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. We'll have to jump into that former high school science teacher bit. Um, I'm interested. Uh, was it like biology or just like straight up general high school? Uh, uh, it was a lot. It was uh, anatomy and physiology and environmental science and physics and physical science. Okay. How long did you do that for? Uh, three years. And then you were like, oh no, I'd much rather bang my head against front end uh, JavaScripty things. Yes. Yeah. Something like yeah. that. Yep. Got it. That JavaScript makes... doesn't talk back usually. Yeah. Yep. Got it. I understand completely. I have kids. Uh, I am John Picozzi, Solutions Architect at EPAM. And today my co-hosts are another Lullabot, uh, also a senior front-end developer, uh, Kat Shaw. Kat, how are you? Hi, I'm doing great. Awesome. Kat's joining us from uh, Perry, Kansas, and uh, has been developing uh, web, doing web development, excuse me, for over 20 years. Last but not least, uh, joining us today, as usual, Nick Laughlin, founder at Enlightened Development. How's it going, Nick? Good morning. Glad to be here. Great. So before we jump into the module of the week, here is Avi from Midcamp to tell us a little bit about Midcamp. Hey, this is Avi, aka Froboy on Drupal.org. I'd like to invite you to Midcamp, April 26th through the 28th in Chicago, Illinois. This is our ninth year of doing Midcamp, and we're super excited to have everybody back in person. We have 30 sessions scheduled for Wednesday and Thursday, as well as boffs, great lunches, and socials going to a Cubs game and a game night. On Friday, we have our contribution day where everybody will get a chance to contribute back to the Drupal community. We're looking forward to seeing you at Midcamp, a yearly camp about web design and development by a group of people with one thing in common. We love Drupal. Go to midcamp.org for more information. Thanks, Avi. Uh, check out midcamp.org for more information. All right, now back to our show and back to our normal module of the week uh, correspondent. Uh, let's bring in Martin Anderson Klutz, a senior solutions engineer at Acquia and maintainer of a number of modules. Martin, what do you have for us this week? Thanks, John. This week, I thought we would talk about the real-time SEO for Drupal module, which provides content authors with immediate feedback about how optimized their content is against specific keywords. It's a module that was created back in September of 2015, and the currently available versions are 8.x-1.8 and 8.x-2.0 alpha 8, both of which were released late last year, in addition to a 7.x-1.2 version. The active development currently seems to be in the 2.x branch, although it's also worth pointing out that it has been in alpha for more than five years. Now, in terms of open issues, there are 108 issues open currently, only eight point, or sorry, only 85 of which are for the 8.x branches, and of those, roughly half or 44 of them are bugs. Which is pretty good when you think about the fact that the module is currently in use by over 21,000 sites less than 20% of which are on Drupal 7. Now the module was originally created by the open social account. And even today, many of the active maintainers are devs who actually work at open social, including King Dutch, who's the author of the most recent releases. Hmm. Now the, the feedback that the module will provide includes not only sort of general analysis, but also specific actionable suggestions like including the keyword in the title, the first paragraph of the content, and even in the meta description. 
The machine name of the module is actually Yoast SEO because it provides similar capabilities to a popular WordPress SEO plugin called Yoast, which actually costs $99 a year to use for the premium version. Eventually, the title of the module or the Drupal.org project was changed because there's no official affiliation. And I really thought this module would be appropriate for today's episode because when you think about how the module works, in many ways, it's actually just a sophisticated wrapper for an open source JavaScript library, a fork of which is now being used because the, uh, the Yoast SEO JS library itself is, is actually deprecated uh, open source. So um, I also think this module is really interesting because there are tools that I think of as kind of you know, automated ways to do kind of technical SEO. So things like you know, meta tag and token, but this module actually provides good feedback to content editors in, in, in terms of sort of the more creative or, or writing aspect of optimizing for keywords and search engines. So uh, has anybody uh, on our discussion today actually used uh, Yoast SEO or maybe some other SEO focused modules? I have only ever used Yoast in conjunction with WordPress sites. And I, I think we talked about this module a little bit on the WordPress episode we had a couple of months back, uh, which is probably where you heard about this uh, module. Um, but yeah, I, I've not used it. I, I think it's worth testing out though like if, if it can provide um it, if it can provide some automated help that's you know that's always help that's useful so I'm, I'm definitely gonna look into it were you about to say automated help is helpful i i caught myself but yeah. yes <laughs> automated help is helpful um yeah, no, I have not used this, but it does seem it does seem very intriguing, and uh, you know everybody's always interested in better SEO. So, um, you know, I think it could be useful. Yeah, I think this module is is most useful when you've got content that really is intended to be keyword targeted. So, if it was going to be, um, you know, a WYSIWYG within a paragraph, it's probably not going to be useful to have that in there. But if you're thinking about like a blog post that is maybe trying to generate relevance against specific keywords. That's I think where, where this module really shines. I mean, I just imagine like super helpful for folks that like don't necessarily know every in and out of SEO. Right. So when you have content editors adding content, like it's good to have those reminders for them to be able to, to produce um, good SEO metadata for their, for their content. So you know, I think that's probably a really good, really good use case that I can think of off the top of my head. I think it would be really interesting if there was some possibility of also having almost like some, even a basic capability for like keyword research built into the tool. Um, but maybe that's part of, of what's in the sort of commercial WordPress plugin as well. I don't, I'm not super familiar with that one. I, I, think I, just, that's they, I think that's what they mentioned that the paid, the paid service is some AI like uh, automatic recognition um, piece. So yeah, it's worth checking. I'd just like to note that um, Word, uh, sorry, Drupal is is saving you, saving you more money than WordPress in this example. Just throwing that, throwing that one out there. Um, I'm not, I'm not biased, I swear. Any other thoughts? No? Well, Martin, as usual, I thank you for your time and uh, bringing us this wonderful module. Let's go to our primary topic. So the idea for this show uh, kind of came from uh, a talk Andy did at the Florida Drupal Camp. So Andy, I wanted to start off uh, wondering if you could give us kind of like a short overview of what that talk was about and... Um, uh, you know, how it pertains to our topic today. Yeah, sure. Um, so the talk I gave at Florida Drupal Camp was the, it was a top 10 list, the top 10 uh, most useful libraries in Drupal 10 core. Um, and it went through 10 libraries that are defined in Drupal core um, that site builders, themers, <clears throat> um, whoever could go ahead and, and make use of in their module or theme or, or whatever. Um, something that's not just core specific or something that's not um, too 
incredibly niche to to really be used elsewhere. The things that people may not know they're getting for free as part of using Drupal. And to to clarify, those libraries are JavaScript libraries, right? They, uh, I think nine of them were were JavaScript. One was uh, CSS only, but nine of them were were all yeah little JavaScript helpers that people could use. Right. So. I, I actually attended that talk because I was I was interested and um, I guess not being a front end developer right didn't necessarily realize that there are a lot of lot of uh, benefits and a lot of libraries that Drupal is using for JavaScript um, kind of out of the box so um, you know I think that was pretty enlightening and uh, led to a talking Drupal topic so um, I look forward to kind of digging into our conversation today. So can you, can you share some of those examples? What are some of the most important JavaScript features or functionality in Drupal? So I think the the first thing that people need to be aware of when they're looking at um, JavaScript libraries from Drupal that they should be using in their own project is going to be the Drupal JavaScript API, um, looking at behaviors um, and attaching those behaviors, uh, as well as the Drupal settings library. Um, so what behaviors allow uh, a front-end developer to do is to say there are multiple times this script can run uh, if we ever update stuff on the page using you know ajax if we ever um, uh, uh, have multiple chunks of the page coming in from big pipe um, we can run this behavior multiple times to make sure that if we're adding event listeners they get attached to everything that needs to get attached um, if we need to do some kind of functionality once something pops up on the page, we want to know when it's actually popped up on the page. Um, so the the behavior system really lets uh, front end developers run JavaScript uh, multiple times on a page instead of just at page load, uh, which would be a more traditional uh, way to, to to run JavaScript. Yeah, things like maybe Drupal announce. So you know, yeah. things mm -hmm. for accessibility um, would be good, right? Yeah, so there's, there were some other ones in there. Um, and uh, I have the slides open here in front of me. Um, and so I can just run through and tally them real quick. We had uh, the core Drupal uh, library, which is the behaviors, Drupal settings, um, which lets backend developers pass information from the PHP side, the, the server side of the equation to the client side and let JavaScript pick up the, the processing from there. Um, after that, we looked at normalize, which is a CSS only uh, library. And then uh, debounce is a great one that we can make use of, um, which will let developers run functionality at the beginning or at the end of a sequence of rapidly firing events. Um, so when you're scrolling on the page, if you want to listen and respond on scroll, scrolling events happen really rapidly. Just scrolling down the page, um, to go from you know what's on the screen now to the next chunk that'll fit on the screen, you could easily throw 100 events. Um, and so we can say, we only care about when we start scrolling or when we finish scrolling and react to that. And so debounce lets us do that. Um, after debounce, we had uh, the announce uh, library, which as Kat mentioned, is uh, great for accessibility um, and lets us pass some, some text to a screen reader um, so that uh, if we have something dynamic happening on the page, um, you know, you or I as, as sighted users can see that information pop up on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, but if somebody's using a screen reader and they've already passed a section of the page that changes, we want to have a way to tell them, hey, there's new content here or announce, you know, some alert has popped up on the page. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, after announce, we had displace, which is useful if you have any kind of fixed positioning. Um, if you have ever used the admin toolbar, uh, which stays stuck at the top of the page, um, we're using the displace library in core to make sure that um, it's not always over overlapping with some relevant information at the top of the page it, that says, hey, push everything down a little bit. Uh, after displace, we looked at the message library, which lets developers uh, use JavaScript to put alerts on the page that are themed the way um, all the normal Drupal messages are. Uh, and then we had once, um, which is really useful for helping select things uh, on the page once and making sure you don't select them again. Um, 
just kind of a, 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 a utility function. And then sortable and tabable are both third-party libraries coming in that let us um, sort things on a page. Um, if you've ever used table drag, it's kind of like that, but a little bit uh, better, a little nicer. Um, and then tabable is a set of utility functions to tell if elements uh, can receive focus um, or if they are in the tab order for focus. And that's the 10. <laughs> that's great. So, so I, I, I was chuckling halfway through because you mentioned Drupal settings and how it allows back-end back -end developers to pass things to front-end developers. And I, I was just thinking it's funny how that relationship is inverse. You know, as a back-end developer, I think Drupal settings is a way for me to expose things for front-end people to use. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just the opposite. Like, I, I've never, it's a simple thing, but I've never thought about it from the opposite way. It's really just an interface for us to communicate, right? Right, yeah. Um, but yeah, Drupal settings, I remember the first time I had a, this was years ago, obviously, but the first time I had occasion to actually use it and add my own custom stuff to it, I was like, oh, that makes so much more sense. I'm curious how much, I went to your talk at Ned Camp last year uh, talking about um, web components. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious about how those interact with things like Drupal behaviors. Because, I, you know, in my experience, they're a little bit removed. Like in general, when you're writing JavaScript in Drupal, it's Drupal where, whereas compo web components really are just kind of, this is not very technical, but kind of like a render engine for an HTML element. So it's not really always completely Drupal aware. Sure. Um, and I'm curious about how you kind of make sure that it's still friendly to Drupal, right? Yeah, um, so web, web components kind of are maybe an exception to writing JavaScript for Drupal, I would say. Because um, with with web components, you have all of the functionality and all of the styles all encapsulated inside a JavaScript class. Um, and you want to tell the browser, you, you're basically handing all of that off to the browser and saying, whenever you see this element in the DOM, this is how it should operate. Whereas in behaviors, we're saying, you know, we'll handle manually assigning all the event listeners we want and handling anything else that way. And we'll respond to that when it comes in from Drupal. Um, but it's it's really kind of passing off the responsibility of anytime we add a card onto the page um, and, and behaviors runs, we need to check for a card and we need to do whatever we need to do for that card to make the card behave the way the card should behave. And you just wrap that up in one little bundle and pass that responsibility off to the browser and say, whenever you see this custom component, this is this is your job now. Please handle it. Yeah. And so um, the the script you write, you're going to write, you know, a class, and you're going to write one function, uh, window dot custom elements dot define, and then you're done. And you don't want to pass that. You don't want to put that in a behavior because if you run that yeah. multiple times, you're going to run into console <laughs> errors as it says we've already defined this. You can't redefine this well i i'm glad i asked because that really valid like i kind of did that but it was always it was always in the back of my mind like is this not quite right because but I, I you're right like you're you're handing it off to a different kind of section of the the pipeline right one's drupal one's browser um right that, that makes sense um by the way you you can check to see if the custom element exists before defining it so you can fix you that can. error which yeah I mean, I just do just in case somebody adds the library to the page twice. You can also wrap it in like a try catch and then yeah. and you'll try it and I'll say, nope, and, and say, no worries. It's, we, yeah. we caught the error and it's not going to, you know, throw any yeah. wrenches in there. That works. And speaking of like Drupal behaviors um, for people that may be new to them, mm -hmm. can you just kind of give like a, a high level, what are Drupal behaviors and why they're important? Yeah, so the the Drupal JavaScript API um, and the core Drupal library um, brings in a couple of uh, uh, JavaScript files. Um, and one of them is going to create a globally scoped object, Drupal. Um, and Drupal is going to have inside of it a, uh, a sub, a property called behaviors. And behaviors will be its own object. And what that does is that provides a global namespace system where I can write my functionality for my module or my theme or 
whatever. And I can attach, I, or I don't want to use the word attach because we're going to use that in a second. That means something else. Um, I can register that behavior under Drupal.behaviors. And so it lives there and it's globally available, but it's really unlikely to conflict with other things. Um, and so in, for example, Olivero, we define our behaviors as Drupal.behaviors.olivero. And then we can put stuff inside that. And then um, all the Olivero script behaviors live under Drupal.behaviors.olivero and we keep everything contained there. And so, um, but then what we can do with that is once the page loads, um, if you're familiar with you know, jQuery, you might have document ready, um, or if you want the vanilla JavaScript version, you respond on uh, DOM content loaded. Once the page is there and it's ready and we're ready to start executing JavaScript, we attach behaviors. Um, and that's a specific method name that's going to loop through all of the defined behaviors and run those functions. And then it's done. And then at some other point in the future, at, in a definite amount of time, could be really soon after if it's big pipe and we've got multiple chunks coming in. Um, or it could be, you know, you've got a views pager that's using Ajax and it switches from page one of the results to page two. We call Drupal attach behaviors again, and it will run through all of those again, so that when the page updates, every behavior that's been defined has a chance to respond to uh, again to the page with its new content. So, so many questions. Um, let me <clears throat> start with um, the first question. You said that for Olivero, you define Drupal.behaviors.olivero. Is that common practice for modules? Um, if it's not, I would say it should be. <laughs> yeah, it, had, um, it okay. has to be unique across it, every right. single script on your site. Like, so and, if you have all the contrib modules, yeah. then you have your own custom modules. They all have to be unique. They, and they do have to be unique. And there's not, you know, we were talking earlier about the web components and, and setting the, the, the new tag name for your new custom element. And if you try to redefine that, it throws an error. That's mm -hmm. not the case in Drupal behaviors. You need to, just you need to be carefully, it. it just overwrites it. Whichever one runs second, now that's the behavior. Or whichever right. one, I guess not second, whichever one's last. So if you have 10 things trying to write the same behavior name, the last one wins. Hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, I imagine that many a developer has run into many a bug because of that, maybe, or maybe not. Maybe it's like a very um, respectable place where everybody looks to see if if their um, you know namespace is, is available. Um, I, I have to be honest. I'm surprised that you don't get more conflicts with that between just random contributed modules, but it seems that it seems that when people are adding behaviors, they do tend to respect that rule and make sure it's named somewhat uniquely to the module that is being added. Yeah. So it's prefixed I, with yeah. the module name or something. And module names yeah. can't be the same anyway. So right. So it kind of kind of fixes itself, manages itself, right? So in theory, if I were looking at Drupal dot behaviors, I'd essentially be able to see a list of all of the behaviors my site had available to it, right? Yeah, if you if you open up your <clears throat> your dev tools on any uh, Drupal site, you can open up in in the console and type in Drupal dot behaviors. That's Drupal with a capital D dot behaviors, um, and it will list out all the behaviors that are defined in there. Um, and then each behavior uh, each behavior should define an attach method on it. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we want to attach all of them. We can say Drupal dot, I think it's just Drupal dot attach behaviors, and it will cycle through all the behaviors and call all their attach functions. Um, you can also define a detach function if there were any reason that you needed to, you know, uh, uh, un uh, uh, remove an event listener mm -hmm. or uh, in some way handle some kind of cleanup before the page unloads. Um, then you can have a, a detach function as well that can cycle through all those. Um, and then if you write a behavior that's going to rely on somebody else's behavior, you can call that one individually just by Drupal behaviors, whatever it's called, dot attach and call its attach function um, on its own. And that's something I've run into before where um, because of the way the JavaScript engine runs through it, there's not a specific order. Um, you, you know, we have 
I forget what the hook name is. There's a hook that lets you reorder the order of the hooks. And so you can say, you know, I want my thing to always run the hook last. There's mm -hmm. not a way to really do that in the, the behaviors setup. It just does it however the JavaScript engine wants to run through it, um, mm -hmm. which it I don't think it's not alphabetical. I think it's the order in which they are attached or they are added to the, the list of behaviors. And, and one of the reasons why, because, you know, as a, you know, when I, you're first interacting with this, one of the things is always like, why do I have to jump through all this rigmarole just to add a simple event listener? Um, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, Andy, but my understanding is that it's one of those things that allows you allows Drupal to ensure that there's consistency in the way and the when Drupal is executing on particular pages. Um, if you didn't have Drupal behaviors, things like big pipe, which we'll talk about in a bit, would not be possible, or it would make your page break randomly with timing effects all the time. Event listeners would seemingly fire at random times, and you would just have to have a ton more stuff in your code to make sure like, okay, has all this stuff happened yet? Now do what I want you to do. Behaviors kind of handles all that stuff in kind of a fairly seamless way to make sure that if you right. tell a library to load this thing at this point, it's going to happen. And it's going yeah, to fire. so there are, there are ways that if, if we were completely rebuilding how behaviors works from the ground up, there are ways that we could do it differently today now that JavaScript has has evolved and matured somewhat since it was the behaviors system was originally conceived. Um, but at the time, you know, if you're on page load is easy, right? A anybody can write jQuery uh, document dot ready and, and throw that in there. And it's just it's just ready. Whenever the page is ready, you'll run this function. But then the problem is anytime we do something with Ajax, right? You've got this this asynchronous aspect of it where we're going to go out, we're going to do something, we're going to come back. And in Ajax, specifically um, jQuery's implementation of it, you have to provide a callback function. But you have to do that when you call Ajax. And so how do I, as a theme developer, say, I want this thing to fire when Views has this Ajax call? How do I put my stuff in their callback? And so you've got to have this kind of global level of, well, my jQuery is run. How do I tell these other things that they need to run their functionality now? you have this global attach method that calls everything else. Yeah, I, I suspect it's also somewhat related to the fact that JavaScript generally, at least in Drupal, is generally a, a client side thing and the PHP stuff is server side. So sometimes a server side thing needs to trigger, you know, a behavior to run again too. So it's, it's kind of a way for everything in Drupal to communicate mm -hmm. on a, a level playing field. So let's take a step back and talk about JavaScript from like the the user interaction point, right? I, I don't think, so one thing that was clear to me after your talk was like, there's a lot of JavaScript stuff happening under the hood in Drupal that I may not necessarily have always been aware of, right? So I guess my question here is like, why or where might somebody interact with JavaScript in Drupal? What are the some of the common places that you see, you know, JavaScript used in Drupal? I would say the the most basic and the most common version would be anywhere you see a button element on, on in the DOM. If not a not a link that looks like a button, but an actual button element. Unless it's a submit button it's got to have some kind of JavaScript behind the scenes to make it work. <clears throat> so a submit button obviously can work as like a submit input and submit a form that then goes off and runs some PHP action. Um, but if you've got a button that's triggering a menu slide out, if you've mm -hmm. got a button that's triggering a menu drop down, if you've got a button that is changing the content on the page, anything that brings a level of, uh, some dynamic aspect to the page is probably JavaScript. There are some ways you can be clever about CSS, um, but they're kind of hacky and they mm -hmm. can have a lot of accessibility issues. Um, so, so running the dynamic portions of a web page through JavaScript is is the better way, in, in my opinion. 
So like yeah, I imagine it, one one example there from from like a site building perspective is like views views probably has a ton of JavaScript to like do the views admin on the back end, right? Uh, yeah, so the, the views admin is a great example because you have all those links that when you click them, they open up some kind of a modal. Yeah. That is, that's calling uh, to the jQuery UI, or I guess was, I don't know if it still is, because um, jQuery UI is, if it's not out yet, it's on its way out. It's already been deprecated. Um, but those modals that pop up are, are, are triggered from JavaScript. And then when you finish in that, it closes it back down and it keeps the page. Um, and so, you know, the URL never changes, but the page does. Um, and so JavaScript is handling all of that. And on the front end, you have, um, if you have a list of views in a pager and you're clicking one, two, three, and you see that little blue spinner, you're, you're seeing JavaScript doing something, making a new request to the server, getting the new content and dropping it into the page. Yep. I wonder with things like views, I mean, we've all been there when we're using views and it gets stuck and it just doesn't load and, you're, and you don't really have an, an alternative to be able to get whatever you need mm -hmm. and then you need to reboot or <laughs> you know rebuild you, the site usually, or whatever. Yeah. You know? Usually if you click something and you see if you see the throbber and either it never goes away or it goes away but nothing has changed. If you open the dev tools you'll see a little red entry that some kind of Ajax error has occurred. It's made the request and you know it got a it, it got a, a 403 or a 404 or uh, in some way didn't get the response it was expecting and panicked and, and threw an error. Mm. You, you know what's interesting about that, and this is purely anecdotal, um, but one of the things I've noticed is if you get an Ajax error on a view like that, like in the admin, and you look in the console log and you copy that error and search for it, I almost never find, res like there's obviously exceptions, but you almost never find actual other people having that issue. Like it's hard to, they feel more generic. So they don't, you'll never find like the specific thing. But then if you go into the database log, if it happened to get to the point where it actually made the request against the database and there's some error thrown, that'll mm -hmm. usually show you what the actual error is. But a Ajax errors are so generic. They're very generic. Um, and and it's been a while since I've had to, to debug one. Um, but I think you have to open up whatever error message comes back and it's not even an error message it's an error object and so you have to get into the object and get yep. the dot message property copy that and then some of that is very specific to your page um and so you have to cut that piece out and then once you're left with the generic bits it's like oh every ajax error ever is just this and so how do i figure out yep. what mine was I, I i also wanted to just quickly plug i think Two weeks ago, we had a, a the module of the week that Martin brought in was develop debug log, and I I recall him mentioning that this helps with Ajax debugging because it dumps all of that information into the log, um, so it might help in those situations too. Um, don't quote me on it; I'll ask him after after the show. But but yeah, like the it, yeah. Don't quote you, have to you on it. You know we are recording, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if it's wrong, just don't point to it. <laughs> There's also um, a Devel accessibility tool um, that can help you with um, if you're having JavaScript errors, um, I believe. I think it's like Devel underscore A L A one one Y. Um, when we were talking about um, JavaScript and and um, accessibility earlier. Very cool. So my next question is about JavaScript in general because. Um, some people still do browse the internet with JavaScript disabled, but I'm curious about like percentages, like how much is that something mm -hmm. that you have to worry about when you're writing functionality? It's, uh, it depends, right? So, um, the, the, the numbers aren't huge percentage wise. Um, and it's hard to get hard numbers on this. Yahoo did a big, study in like 2010 um and so you know that's that data is 13 years old but they concluded something along the lines of like one percent of their traffic came from people who had javascript disabled um there's another site that i was looking at earlier um and they were saying you know less than one percent i think there's were uh let's see here 
0.2% of page views from worldwide traffic. But there's some nuance hidden inside that number, right? So looking at who has JavaScript disabled, if you think about the kind of person that would do that, they're probably more technical. They are probably more concerned about either uh, uh, performance or in these days, more likely they're concerned about privacy. And so depending on who the target audience of a site might be, your traffic might be higher if you're serving people who are technical and very privacy minded. So 0.2% of traffic worldwide for this site, you know, might not be the same as the, the percentage of traffic to your site. Um, the other thing is traffic is not the same as users. You're looking at a percentage of page views total, not a percentage of who is coming to the site. Um, so things to keep in mind when, when you start hearing those numbers. Sorry, I just think it's funny that um, like one percent of people that use Yahoo are browsing without without JS. And it just like you know, kind of speaks to the to the people that are there or the 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 users that could potentially be going to Yahoo with without I, JavaScript turned on. I, I bet you to Andy's point. I bet you it's more like 0.2 percent of people going to or one percent of people going to Yahoo are using no JavaScript, but ninety percent of people that don't use JavaScript are using DuckDuckGo. So that could also be something, right? Is you got that the the other thing they broke down was um, uh, a somewhat unsurprising finding is that 10.5 percent of page views from Tor visitors disable JavaScript. So mm -hmm. you know if you're if somebody's coming to you via the Tor browser, they're obviously very privacy minded, and they're going to turn off JavaScript so that you know your your Google tracking tags or whatever aren't following them from page to page. Interesting. And I, I think that, um, you know, the key there is that most users do use JavaScript. So as long as developers write it properly and they don't, you know, write it exclusively for mouse users and mm -hmm. and um, and they make sure that their navigation is keyboard accessible and, and things like that, then they should be fine. So as long as it's semantic and stuff, it should, you know, should be fine, right? Yeah. And the other thing to consider is when you're creating... A component, whether it's an accordion or a, a, a tab group or something of that nature, um, you want to you want to go through a process called progressive enhancement. Instead of saying if you don't have JavaScript, you just don't get accordions, it's like well, okay, but we start assuming there's no JavaScript. What does the content look like? And so you have proper heading structure with content, and so you can jump heading to heading and get more or less the feeling of oh, this could be an accordion. And then as soon as you enable JavaScript, it says, cool, now we can take that, we can read whatever the structure is and say each heading should now be a button, the content should get wrapped and get collapsed, and, and then you can move from mm -hmm. accordion to accordion. Um, so progressive enhancement is a really good practice when you start bringing a lot of JavaScript in um, so that your users who don't have JavaScript or if for whatever reason you know your JavaScript is on Cloudflare and Cloudflare crashes but your server hasn't, you know, well, the JavaScript doesn't come down. They're still browsing. They don't have it disabled, but they didn't ever got the JavaScript, but your content is still there. Interesting. Exactly. So they're able to still complete whatever goal they need to do. Um, so the JavaScript isn't like a, a requirement necessarily. It's just adds, it just adds functionality, but um, that makes total sense. Unless you're using web components and then just nothing <laughs> works. <laughs> you know, well, not, that's not entirely true anymore. Um, so the Safari 16.4 just came out like yesterday, I think. Uh, and Chrome has had this for a while. I think Firefox is the one browser at the time of this recording that doesn't support declarative shadow DOM, where you can put in an element and put in a template element and send it down just through the HTML page and the browser will look at that and go, oh, they mean to make a web component here, and this is what the shadow root looks like, and then it'll render it. Now, it won't have any any of the internal JavaScript functionality, but the content will still render. So there are there are definitely ways of um, in the here in the near future where web components hmm. could theoretically work for someone who has JavaScript disabled. Interesting. No, no, we're going to go down a yeah, uh, web components yeah. rabbit hole because that Nick really loves web components. Go ahead, Nick. So so really quickly, that would mean that if you're taking content from attributes and placing it in the shadow root, that still won't work 
but if you have slots, because that's just native HTML, that would, so it, re it really is encouraging you to put content in slots if you're using declarative shadow roots. Correct. And it, it brings in that aspect of progressive enhancement of how do yep. we make a web component that can render if everything else, if the JavaScript breaks and doesn't come in, can we at least still show the content? And, and what does that look like? I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie. Declarative shadow roots sound very nefarious. <laughs> They're not, but okay. That's very cool. Okay. We well, have... I mean, don't leave us hanging. What are they? So the, the, the shadow Dom um, is not some twilight zone nonsense. It is when you have a web component, um, you have, you have the, the traditional document comes down, just the HTML document. And when the browser parses through that, it creates the DOM, the document object model. And so it has in its memory, the document. And then what a web component is able to do is attach a, sh a shadow DOM. And so it creates basically other little document objects that are stored and they're all separate. And then the browser just knows how to link from one to the next during the rendering process. So not declarative shadow DOM, traditional shadow DOM is all defined through the JavaScript object and saying, how do we, what's the internals of this thing look like? And then declarative shadow DOM is just saying, we're going to pass that information in the main DOM and we're going to declare, this is what it looks like. And then the browser can parse that and do stuff with it without ever having to use JavaScript. So on a practical level for our listeners and maybe John, um, let's say that you're going to create a component that's, you know, talking Jubal TD accordion, right? Mm -hmm. And it has a heading, it has some content, right? If you, so when you're putting that content on the page, you're going to use an HTML element called, you know, angle bracket TD dash accordion angle bracket, right? Yep. If it's a traditional web component and JavaScript doesn't run, you're going to see a TD dash accordion element on the page and there's not going to be anything in it. Yeah. But, well, uh, Oh, because the shadow no. root won't attach. If you if you but, put it right, if it, you put stuff inside it, right? So if you put if you've got that wrapped around an H2 and a paragraph tag, the H2 and the paragraph will still render. Yeah. Yep. A absolutely. Um, but nothing else will happen. If Correct. you are using a declarative shadow DOM and you are saying like put this content in an H4 and put everything else in a paragraph, that will still happen. But the the click action still won't work. It'll be more like the um, progressive enhancement that Andy talked about before, just show a heading content, heading right. content. So it's, and if it's you basically, have, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, Andy. And if you have any other internal, like, so if you, with a with a traditional one, you have your, your TD accordion heading paragraph. Before the JavaScript loads, the TD accordion is going to render, um, using the CSS property display contents, which is effectively ignore me. I don't exist. Just look, show the stuff that's inside of me. Mm -hmm. And then once the JavaScript comes in and defines how the, the shadow DOM is supposed to look, there may be other elements in the shadow DOM, divs, spans, uh, uh, details elements, whatever you want to put in there, you can put other HTML elements in there. And then eventually a slot. And that is where like the little window where the H1 and the paragraph tag can peek through. With declarative shadow DOM, you would get all of those internal other components or all the other internal elements, the divs, the spans, whatever is, else is in there. Um, maybe an SVG icon as to, to indicate your open and closed state. Um, that would all still render, but like you said, your, your click handlers wouldn't work. So you would need to make sure that on render, everything is open. And then if you have JavaScript, then you can close it real quick before anybody sees the open stuff. Which, which will cause problems with like your cumulative sh layout shift if <laughs> yeah. it's a complex problem. So, but yeah, it, 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 it basically allows you to write a web component in a way that if your JavaScript fails, right, right now, basically, if your JavaScript fails for web components, <clears throat> traditionally, you'll just get no content uh, except for right. slot, slotted content. With this other way, you can still get, you get a lot more yeah. of, a structured document basically a progressive loading of a page right and like when i say loading i mean like structure wise right like your html your initial load is your html structure and then within your html structure you're gonna have a component 
if you, the way you guys are proposing it, right, if you set it up that way, that component provides a structure to that HTML so that it can load that. And then if like your JavaScript loads, then it loads you know, kind of your, like your dynamic assets or you, and your or it loads your content and it loads your dynamic assets, right? So it's just page basically different layers of the page structure. So like bet, you can either be kind of flat or more more advanced. I, I bet you it's a pretty big performance enhancement too, because you're shipping, it sounds like you're shipping that declarative shadow DOM with the initial page load and not having to wait for right. it to be attached in the first place. So I, for the first page visit, yeah. And as long yeah. as as long as you've got stuff cached well, um, you know, the second page visit, you say, "Hey, I need that TD according against this." Oh, I've already, I've already done that. It's right here. Um, yeah. And so, you know, on, on subsequent page loads, I think the performance benefits are are negligible. But yeah, yeah. on that first one, definitely. And, and the truth is, you want to, you want things like media and things to be in slots anyway, because the, the same reason you want them to load it on the initial page load, not after mm -hmm. the attachment, because then you just have to wait longer. But anyway, I think we can get back to the actual show notes. <laughs> that was that was a nice diversion though. So I had a question kind of back to what you were talking about before with jQuery. So mm -hmm. why is Drupal moving away from it? Um I think you ask different people, you'll get different answers to that. Um the the reason I think it's important for Drupal to move away from jQuery um is simply to remove a dependency that I think isn't necessary anymore. Um, so JavaScript was created like part of the Netscape browser in 95 and then was uh, reverse engineered for Internet Explorer in 96. And then later in 1996, it was sent off to uh, the Euro European Computer Manufacturers Association, I think is what it was. Now they're just called ECMA. And so you may have heard of ECMAScript or ES. Um, mm -hmm. But in the early days of JavaScript, live script, copy, whatever it was that, that they were calling it at the time. Um, DOM manipulation was really hard. Um, if you wanted to get an element, you had to go document dot get element by ID or get element by class or get element by tag name or whatever it was. And so there were just all of these really verbose methods um, to, to get stuff to then be able to work with it. Um, the, the methods that existed on the data types, your arrays, um, objects, stuff like that were not nearly what they are today. And the implementations could be different from browser to browser. Um, so what jQuery did and was a huge uh, boost for front end developers was saying, here's this one method that you can use to get something with a CSS selector and then we'll handle the browser differences. We'll check if this method exists, then this method, then this method, and we'll get it all for you and be able to do this stuff for you. Here in 2023, the language is very standardized. Um, the the ECMA has done a great job um, standardizing the language and make sure everybody implements the same stuff. Um, the browsers are much more mature. The language is more mature. And so jQuery just isn't really necessary anymore, um, you know, unless the developer needs it, right? We don't we don't need it to handle how browsers do things. We need it because it's what the developer knows. Um, and so removing that dependency, removing the the additional assets that have to be downloaded on the client side, uh, reducing page size, all of that is is I think a a better goal to have than just keeping it around because people are used to it. So it filled a gap for. It filled, it filled a huge yeah. gap yeah. for I a mean, long time really great. well. <laughs> you know, uh, in um, the, the, I have the Wikipedia page for jQuery open here. Uh, in 2019, jQuery was used on 80% of the top 1 million websites. So it's wow. still very prevalent. It's still very much out there. Um, mm -hmm. And it's still very useful for a lot of people. But for Drupal, you know, we have the security coverage. If jQuery ever has an issue with security, it necessitates a new... Uh, Drupal update. If we remove jQuery from core, we we don't have that security you know vulnerability there anymore. Um, so yeah, I think it's just it's it's and you know the the platform is better. And so using something that is offloading work from the main thread to the web APIs is is a better implementation as well um, for just more performant code. So 
am I am I correct in my in my understanding or my assumption that like jQuery was really kind of created, implemented to kind of fill gaps in overall JavaScript, um, you know, over overall JavaScript, you know, standards basically. And now JavaScript has kind of because of its you know increase in popularity has has developed standards that that you know make jQuery kind of less less needed. Is that kind of a way to sum it up? I, that's my understanding, right? Is jQuery, I think, was created at a time when the standards didn't exist or weren't really followed very well. The standards may have existed, but it's actually on the browsers to implement the version of the standards that exist. Right. Um, and so if they don't, then jQuery fills that hole and is, is a, a solid, single API that developers can use that then handles the different implementations. Um, but right. it also added a couple of other things that were just generally hard to do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, jQuery's built-in Ajax method made it really easy for a lot of people for the first time to do get requests instead of having to say, construct a new XML HTTP request, and here's the address, mm -hmm. and here are the headers, and here's all of this, and making this, you know, 20, 30 lines of code just five lines, yeah, making right. it a, a much easier thing to do. So, so it filled, go ahead. Yeah, it leveled the playing field and then and then provided some additional functionality to make things make things easier. Yeah, and, and there's, a, and there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things that started in jQuery that were filling those gaps that mm -hmm. have since been pulled back into JavaScript. We now have the document query selector, which says just take a CSS selector, could be really complex, and we'll get everything that matches that selector. Yeah. Um, the, the fetch API is super easy mm -hmm. to work with. Um, and mm -hmm. it's, it's easier now than even the jQuery Ajax one. It's just fetch. Here's the, the URL. There's a sensible set of default options, or you can override them as needed. Um, and then that brings everything back. And then we get promises, yeah. which are really nice and async await. Um, the, the web platform has really moved, I think, past what jQuery has been able to do in some places and, and makes more sense to use the platform. Yeah, it, it, it was, it was, I mean, it's still great. It does a lot of stuff, but it, it's all, aside from security, it's also a larger, you know, it's, it's a JavaScript. It's not quite a framework in the same sense that like React is a framework or Angular is, but it, yeah, it's, it's, it's a library. Kind of, it's a, it's yeah, but it feels like it's more than a library. <laughs> like, a library is like you 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 download this one little library that does this one very specific thing. jQuery does, and it has its own ecosystem of mm -hmm. a bunch of plugins and stuff. Like if you've ever used Better Exposed filters, you know that you have to have like twenty five different jQuery uh, plugins <laughs> to get everything to work. Yeah. Um, speaking of React and Angular, I'm. I'm curious about your opinion on Drupal um, having a front end JS framework that it's going to ship with. I mean, it's been a discussion for a long time. I think. Do you think? Do you think it's going to happen? Do you think Drupal needs that? Um, do I think it's going to happen? I don't think it'll ever replace. Well, I don't want to say ever, but as long as Drupal is based on is built on top of Symphony, I don't think a JavaScript framework is going to unseat Twig, mainly because. Twig is really, really good at all of the stuff and, and working with the back end because Twig is just more PHP. Um, but also because there's been such an effort to get off the Drupal Island and now everything is very Symfony based and Symfony centric. But also you can still use a JavaScript framework if you want with the JSON API module or you know GraphQL modules are out there if you want to use GraphQL instead. Um, so the 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 idea of replacing Twig to do something that's already possible, I think, doesn't make sense. Pulling out one function um, and not even replacing it with something, just pulling it out because you're saying we don't we don't think Twig is is useful anymore because we have this JavaScript world. Yeah. Do you think there's going to be some core or near core themes that will implement these directly, or do you think it's just going to maintain like if if you need to? Uh, a site I don't, that needs that you do it yourself. I don't think we'll see a theme implemented. Maybe, eh, maybe there was talk a while ago. You know, before before Claro, there was uh, there was an effort led, I think, by 
uh, Cat and I's coworker, Sally, um, to do a new admin theme that was, I think, React based. Um, okay. I was never involved in any of those discussions. That was before my time working on core stuff. Um, but that was proposed. It was then not implemented. We're using Claro now, which is great and beautiful, and I love it. Um, but it's not React based, you know. Um, I would say there is going to be more JavaScript frameworks coming to core because uh, Project Browser is using Svelte. Yeah. The nice thing about Svelte, it just compiles down to JavaScript and it's not like you have to send instructions on how to run Svelte code along with the Svelte code the way you do with React. Um, but yeah, JavaScript is going to continue to grow in, in core in the future for sure. So, so Svelte will require something in the build process possible uh, on the Drupal framework side. And of course, on your side, if you want to take advantage of writing your own, but it doesn't come with like additional server dependencies. Right. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't, you don't have to ship off some Svelte specific code to the client side eventually to whoever's using it to be able to use the code written for mm -hmm. Svelte. Um, whereas with React, you send off your React code and also the main React library that says, knows how to run that and, and how to compile yeah. that and render it. Um, Svelte just compiles down to, to vanilla JavaScript. So, I mean, I would imagine that maybe someday in the future, as opposed to like, as opposed to like a wholesale change, like, right, there are these, this idea of um, starter kits or recipes that, that Drupal is coming out with right now right mm -hmm. um i imagine like someday in the future there could be like a a headless or js framework starter kit or or recipe that would allow you to kind of like have a starting point where you could say hey i want to work with Re you know react or gatsby mm -hmm. or um you know next js or whatever whatever it is right um and like that would be kind of your starting point as opposed to kind of like a wholesale change to the to the theme system. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that I think you're 100 percent right in that that once especially once we get recipes, I'm very looking forward to recipes. Um, sorry. Those, sorry, Andy, you broke up there. What was that first part again? I love recipes. I'm looking oh, forward to recipes. I see what you did there. OK. I was more talking about the part where you said I was right, but that's all right. Continue. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> um, no, I mean you are right. I think I think recipes are going to bring a lot of a lot of uh, interesting change and innovation um, to the contrib space. Um, and one of those things I, I could definitely see being a you know I have this site that I've made the traditional way, um, and I would like to add a decoupled channel to my site, and you just call the recipe and it brings in whatever modules and configuration you need to expose everything you want as as JSON API endpoints or as GraphQL endpoints mm -hmm. um, and resolvers and whatnot so that you can you can make use of a site that already exists. Um, you know, there are guides that are written on how you can do that, but the idea that says, you know, I just please bring in decoupled to my site and then it just does it, it is right. I think is going to be a, a, a huge boost. Yeah. Totally makes things easier for everybody. Um, so we talked about kind of caching a little bit. We've actually mentioned the word big pipe quite a bit throughout the show um, to this point. I'm wondering if you can A, tell us what big pipe is, and then B, tell us if uh, we need to worry about big pipe if we're, you know, building JavaScript for Drupal. Yeah, so I can tell you what big pipe is, um, and I can tell you what it will do to your site. I cannot tell you how it works um, because it's it's cool, um, but it's very back endy. Um, so big pipe was a technique um, developed by Facebook, and what it was for is if you can think back to the days of like 2010 Facebook or 2013 Facebook, um, you have these different pieces of the page that have different levels of cacheability. You know, you have your main feed in the center where it needs to go and it needs to request from the database all of your friends posts and it's going to put them in the middle. But right above that, you've got a form and that form is super cacheable, right? It's the same form for everybody that ever is going to log into Facebook. But your feed is very personalized to you. On the left hand side of the page, there's, you know, a menu that's got, you know, show me my friends, show me my groups, show me my events, show me my photos, highly cacheable. 
And so what BigPipe is doing is it says, let's look at this page. And instead of looking at the page as a whole and saying, you know, we're going to send a request to the server, then the browser is just going to wait and waste cycles while the, the, the server compiles one page. And it's going to send that all back. And now the server can't help anymore. And the browser has to chew through all of the stuff that it's got and get all the JavaScript going. It says, instead of having A and then B, how can we let them work at the same time? And so it makes the request and the server says, cool, you've requested these and they call them uh, pagelets. You've got requested these pagelets that are super cacheable. We'll send those right now. And now the browser can start working on that while the server is still handling some of the slower stuff. Here's your feed that's got a lot of, a lot of interesting stuff, um, but it's going to come in second and then it sends it off. And so it's a way to, to get that first contentful paint on the browser very quickly and then send in stuff later while uh, uh, handling things that are super cacheable versus things that are super uh, personable. And so um, there's a there's a, an article in the show notes for this. Um, and then there's, if you, I haven't put this in the, the resources, but I will, is a link to Big Pipe when it was first added to Drupal, showing the rendering difference of Drupal with and without Big Pipe, where you've got a main page of content and then a block that's available based on who is logged in. And you see content and then the block pops in second. And it's that second piece of the, the page coming down from the server. Why is this relevant to JavaScript? Is because when you get that first piece, that's when your jQuery document ready or your DOM content loaded event fires off. And so if you're responding to that, you don't have the whole page yet. And so if your J JavaScript is trying to hit something that's not on the page yet, you can't do it. And so then when that second piece comes down, that's when Drupal says, cool, we've got this new piece. Let's call in the attached behaviors method that we were talking about earlier and, and run that JavaScript again. Interesting. So, you know, I think, you know, big pipe is very cool. And, um, you know, I think it's definitely one of those things that helps kind of like perceived, well, I guess it helps actual page page speeds, but it's also kind of perceived page speed, right? Cause you're mm -hmm. getting the content faster and, and those, those custom bits are kind of loading in after the fact. So like, as far as, you know, JS goes, right? Do you have to, I'm assuming you have to like, you kind of have to be aware when you're working with Drupal or you're working on a site, if, um, if, uh, you know, big pipe is enabled, like, do you, do you specifically have to write your JS to say like, Hey, make sure if big pipes enabled, like you're waiting for everything to load before you do the thing that I need you to do? Um, no, you don't have to do that. Um, there are several ways around that. Um, one is to use the once library. Um, and what that'll let you do is you use the function once and you pass it a query selector. And once will search the page for all elements that match that query selector. Uh, and you've also passed it some string um, that, that the once function refers to as an ID. And so it's going to go through, it's going to find all of the matching elements for that query selector. And then it's going to check, have we already processed it against this ID? And if we have not, then it will return it to an array of all the matching things that have not been selected before. And so if you run your, instead of using document.querySelector to find the things, if you run it through once, that first page runs, if there's anything matching it on that main section of the page, it'll go through it with the once. And when that second piece comes in, you call once again, and it'll search the whole page for everything that matches the query selector and filter out the stuff in that main section that's already been processed and then mm -hmm. only run on the new bits. The other thing you can do is in your, um, when your behavior, when you're defining it, is it'll pass in uh, what it calls a context. And on the first run through, context is the same thing as document. It's the whole, the whole page, the whole document. After that, it is only the chunk of the page that has changed. And so if that's a views pager, context is the, the, the window with all of your new results in it. It, or if it's big pipe, um, you know, it's the admin toolbar or it's that personal personalized block on the side. And so selecting from context um, lets you say, you know, whether there's big pipe or not, 
just give me context and we'll search in context for the thing that I need. So uh, speaking of once, um, once became a, a library in Drupal in I think 9.2 or maybe 9.3 and was removed. And we used to, Drupal used to use jQuery once. jQuery once was completely removed from Drupal 10. So if you're updating modules from Drupal 9 to Drupal 10, you're probably going to use once. You're going to have to reformat that. Um, I think it's a good move because it removes that as part of removing the jQuery dependency. But one of my questions is, <laughs> there's, by the way, there's great documentation on how to update it. It gives you like, here's all these different scenarios and here's all the ways to replicate that in your custom code. Um, I'm curious why the format changed so much. Do you know anything about that? I mean, it takes a lot of the same parameters, but the orders changed and how, how you tag it changed. Yeah, so it, it's been a while since I've written anything with jQuery. So if you're, if you're more familiar with this, let me know where I'm getting this wrong. With jQuery once, you were doing the selector first yep. and then dot once with your ID, right? Yep. And it's so as as that, that's, that's how I'm remembering it as well. And so what that's doing is that's saying jQuery is going to first run that selector bit and when it returns, it returns the jQuery object with whatever its iterator of, of matched items is. And then that object is getting passed into that chained method, the dot once. What we're doing now is we just have a function once. And instead of saying document.query selector, give me all this stuff, and then once is just filtering it, once is just handling all of that internally. So the syntax is changing just, I think, to make it, instead of being a a, a two function operation, making it a one function operation. Hmm. I, I figured it was something like that, but it, it didn't seem like it was an exact analog. Um, but I mean, it, it, it is much cleaner and it's pretty straight, like it's pretty straightforward to modify um, from jQuery once to the, the once function. I think, I think the other thing is because the way jQuery selection works, um, you can select when you, because when you have you know the dollar sign in the parentheses, when you're using that to get something in jQuery, you can pass it a string and it will search for stuff that matches that. You can pass it a reference to something you've already selected. You can pass it an array of references, and that doesn't really exist anywhere in the web API. That's not a thing that we really have access to. So once is letting us do that all at once, and so you can have if you already have an array or if you already have a reference or you just have a selector string, all of those can be passed in to once to get what you want. So going back to the components, since that was such a popular topic earlier. Um, oh boy, danger. danger. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know Andy and I, we, we've talked about components and you've presented on it internally. Um, um, how will, how do you think um, JavaScript components and single folder components will shape um, how Drupal interacts with JavaScript. Um, so single single folder components or single directory components um, is a new thing that is really close to being added into 10.1. Um, oh, really? I'm not, what's that? I didn't know that was that close. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really close to being added in as experimental in 10.1. Um, mm -hmm. And what this will allow you to do is right now if you want to create some component, whether you know, going back to your your TD accordion, we're not talking web components here. We're talking just user interface components, so just an accordion using traditional divs and and buttons and stuff like that. the The way you would have to do that up to now is you'd have to create your HTML structure in Twig, and you would have to define the CSS you need and the JavaScript you need in a library. And you would need to make sure that the library is attached when that twig is used using the attached library function in twig. And so you've got your JavaScript file potentially in some JavaScript folder with all your other JavaScript. You've got your CSS in some CSS directory structure. You've got your twig in your templates folder, and you've got your library in your libraries.yaml file. And so you've got four or more files to make this one component work spread across your module or across your themes um, file system. And what single directory components is doing is saying, let's move all those files to live next to each other and create one new file. I, I think it's a YAML file. Um, and so with this one YAML file, we can say, this is 
the component's name, and this is the twig that it needs, and the CSS that it needs, and the JavaScript that it needs. And Drupal can read that and create a new library on the fly that brings everything in that it needs. And so everything that you want for this component lives in the same directory. And it's very easy to say, what JavaScript is impacting this? Oh, it's right here. It's just right next to the twig file that I was using. Um, and helps helps to alleviate cases where you might want to take ownership of some other module's component and then having to go find all of the relevant pieces that you need to pull to make that work. Um, and you just say, hey, I have that whole folder. I'll pull that out and put it in my thing. Um, how does that change how JavaScript works? Probably not much. Um, it's, it's still going to be behaviors. It's still going to be going through the library's API. It's just that the library gets created for you at runtime or build time. I'm not sure exactly how it works. Um, but I don't, I don't see that changing much of how people write JavaScript for Drupal. I just think it's going to be a new way to structure um, your components. Um, as for web components, um, I would caution people who think web components are the next hot thing and want to use them everywhere. Um, they have a lot of things that they can really complicate. So um, web components, while cool and while um, powerful in some ways, are going to cause headaches and others that you may not anticipate. Do you have a short, brief description of what some of Man, those issues I knew he be? was gonna I knew he was gonna bite on that. The second you said it, I was like, Nick's all in. He's I was got debating it. whether to ask, but he's got I, him. I, I, Here I, it is. We don't need to go. To, we don't need to belabor this, but I, I think we should at least give a, a brief heads up on. What I mean, so, so the number one thing we already talked about: if they don't have JavaScript, what shows up on the page? Um, secondly, styles in the shadow root don't touch anything outside of the shadow root. They can inherit some properties, like fonts will inherit down. Um, CSS variables or CSS custom properties will inherit into the shadow root. But if you have a global style sheet, you there are ways to get in through through you know clever structuring of your web components. But it's really hard to get global styles to impact things in a web component. Um, and what I've seen that end up leading to is you end up creating web components to hold on to styles that would have normally been on the global style sheet. Your global style sheet shrinks. And so when you need more styles to do something else, you're like, well, I'll just make another web component. And so you wind up in this kind of vicious cycle where you've made one web component, but we just need one more. And then we just need one more. And now suddenly everything is web components and your entire Drupal site is this massive JavaScript thing that you've built and it didn't need to be. Um, and I've seen this uh, in mm -hmm. practice end up leading to frameworks that are recreating native DOM elements. You know, you, you say, oh, we want this cool table component then use a table element. Don't make a new table thing because the, the the semantics are already there. The accessibility is already there. All of the styles that the browser renders tables in are already there. Just use the native elements that you need and only create web components for things that are like, I just wish HTML had this one additional thing that, that it doesn't have that I could reach for. Then you make that one thing and then you leave it be. Interesting. On our current project, we're using um, I mean, Mateo. He actually is the maintainer for it. It's a component libraries theme server. So the uh, for Drupal module and so it's CL underscore server. And we're using it with Storybook. And so it's actually been interesting to connect that with Drupal. Um, and it's been working for us. It took a little bit of a learning curve for us, but um, it's been working just fine uh, and it connects with twig just fine and um and that's the single directory for each component and everything so i i think it's uh it's worked really well i guess uh is there anything else you wanted to say about uh javascript and components or is that about it i think that about covers it cool awesome so Andy, let's put on our our uh, you know future future gazing goggles here, and uh, can you tell us uh, what you think the future of JavaScript in Drupal looks like? Near term, I think it looks very similar to what it looks like today. Um, I think JavaScript, specifically in Drupal, like in core, is is pretty stable and probably doesn't change much um, going forward. Um, you might see 
some innovations here and there, like what we've seen with the components, if there was going to be some new, something new added to, to you know, the JavaScript standard library um, or the web APIs, um, you know, we might bring some of that stuff into core and start using it. Um, for example, Olivero has started making use of intersection observers and resize observers and mutation observers, which are all things that have come to JavaScript in the last five years, I think the oldest one is. Um, but overall, I think the way that we write JavaScript now for Drupal and the best practices now for Drupal will continue to be that for some time. What does JavaScript around Drupal look like? How are people going to use it? I think I think we'll see probably people more uh, wanting to do decoupled. Um, I think a lot of people reach for that before they know all the pros and cons of it. And if you would like to know more about that, you can find John's recording from his Florida Drupal camp thing about how to make that decision. Um, but I think you're going to see people that want to use decoupled Drupal with some framework and, and want to do that. Um, I think you'll see people continuing to use um, kind of one-off widgets, uh, whether they're React or Vue or Angular or Svelte or whatever it is. I think you'll continue to see people start to drop those into the middle of um, Drupal pages. Um, but I don't think JavaScript really within Drupal changes much in in the near future. All right. I mean, I think I think that is uh, I think that is a good good synopsis, and uh, I, I tend tend to agree with you for for what it's worth. Um, Andy, I appreciate your time. I think this has been super interesting, and um, you know, I really I really definitely learned learned a few things from it. Do you have questions or feedback? You can reach out to Talking Drupal on Twitter with the handle Talking Drupal, or by email with show at talkingdrupal dot com. You can connect with our hosts and other listeners on Drupal Slack in the Talking Drupal channel. You can promote your Drupal community event on Talking Drupal. Learn more at TalkingDrupal.com slash TD promo. Get the Talking Drupal newsletter for show news, upcoming Drupal camps, local meetups, and much more. You can sign up for the newsletter at TalkingDrupal.com slash newsletter. Thank you, patrons, for supporting Talking Drupal. Your support is greatly appreciated. You can learn more about becoming a patron at TalkingDrupal.com and hitting that Become a Patron button in the sidebar. All right, everybody, we have reached the end of our show, and uh, it is time for contact information and shameless self-promotion. So, Andy, if our listeners wanted to get a hold of you, how could they go about doing that? Uh, you can find me on uh, Mastodon uh, at andy-bloom uh, at drupal.community. Um, I'm also on Twitter, technically, at andy underscore bloom. Um, and, uh, but that will redirect you mostly to my Mastodon. And then uh, you can find me at DrupalCon in Pittsburgh this June. I'll be leading a training on advanced front-end techniques. Um, it is not all JavaScript. So uh, if you aren't interested in JavaScript, you can still come and learn something. A little bit of CSS I'm imagining in there as well. Uh, and a fair amount of PHP for, for front-end developers that maybe aren't familiar with PHP that much. Cool. Okay. Sounds good. Kat, what about you? You can find me on the various social media uh, sites and Drupal um, on, with Kat Ann Shaw. So that's K-A-T-A-N-N-S-H-A-W. And uh, that's the best way to reach me. There you go. Nick Laughlin. You can find me pretty much everywhere at Nixvan, N-I-C-X-V-A-N, and my home automation talk at Nerd Summit is up on YouTube, so I'll have that in the show notes. You I watched that the that. other day, and oh, it was very interesting. Oh, I would, re I like would definitely, I would definitely recommend it if you're diving, you want to dive in head first into like home automation and and um, see all of the cool ways Nick has Nick has used uh, home automation. So. I, uh, two big thumbs up for that one. Uh, I am John Picozzi. Uh, you can find me on all the major social networks at John Picozzi, as well as drupal.org. And you can find out about EPAM at epam.com. And if you've enjoyed listening, we've enjoyed talking. See you guys next week. Have a good one, everyone.